G'day everyone. Um, I thought I'd just do a quick update on how the project's going. Um, everything has uh, got grit on the bases and everything is undercoated. Um, in front of you I've just got some of the items that are on the desk. I've put some away in the drawer and left a few things out. I, I had a brainwave today. I, I thought just to make this a little bit different, I thought I might, um, following our dark age theme here, might Every now and then I make a video, maybe read from a book or something, or something that has a bit of flavour to do with the miniatures that we're looking at or something like that. Um, either a secondary source or a primary source or something like that. Um, so I thought today to start it off, um, I was thinking we've got, um, Paul sent me, we've got three, uh, sorry, six different um monastic priestly type characters here all quite different um and i've kind of grouped them um because it's an interesting discussion in itself um and you know we often include them on the war games table and certain rule sets have special rules for the holy man or or, or whatever it might be depending on the army you're fielding but um but it's interesting to think about in the Dark Ages um, or starting from sort of late antiquity and the early centuries of Christianity and through the early medieval period, how the role of monastic and priests and, and things changed. Um, and uh, yeah, um, so what well, I've sort of laid them out, I've sort of... I was thinking, you know, how obviously in the earlier days, although this one I think is meant to, I, I don't know about the character from the show. I just put him there as a sort of a interesting sort of marker. He ha he hasn't got a um, sort of like a monk's sort of haircut or anything like that. He looks like, he actually reminds me of Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments, <laughs> the way he's looking. But um, yeah. He's preaching or something or exhorting or rebuking or doing something. And then we've got this guy, perfectly non-aggressive, just proclaiming the gospel, that sort of thing. And then you've got a sort of perhaps a, a penitent um, priest or something, you know, carrying a cross. Um, he's very ragged, sort of he's probably taken some sort of vows of poverty or something like that. And then you've got a progression um as we go further into the medieval period, you start to see more of um, priestly people who engage in acts of violence, <laughs> and that some of some sort of certain doctrines or come out of Rome and things that kind of bend the rules a bit for people feel that they can. Uh, uh, you know things like oh you, it's okay if you don't use a bladed weapon you 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 can you can only use a cudgel or something like that you can biff people and things and and it wasn't unusual for um people in monastic orders to have come from um an elite class um to have you know grown up with weapon in hand and learned to ride and to hunt and all that sort of stuff and so here we've got this guy here with his cudgel and his uh, male burney on um waving a cross in the air. And, uh, and then we go to, we've got that right at the end of the period, um, perhaps, um, although this one I've got here at the end, we'll come to that in a sec, but um, I believe this is Leofric, who I think was a bishop, wasn't he? Was he on the Norman side or the Saxon side? Anyway, who I think made an appearance at Hastings. So he, he has a, a, a helmet, so he's got a metal helm, but he's wielding a, cudgel of some description and holding a cross um no that's right wasn't the norman bishop odo or something and this must be the the anglo-saxon one and then we move on to this guy in the end who is actually carrying a bladed weapon now as i've mentioned before perhaps perhaps it uh, the theory was that they could get away with it if it wasn't sharpened they just whack people with the flat of their sword i don't know but um you start to when you get towards the era later in the 11th century, we certainly see um, some strange things 
you know, strange um, in terms of how they veered off course into saying that it was okay for monastic orders to go on crusade and to engage in all sorts of violence. So, yeah, how, you know, things would change. But interestingly, um, I'll, I'll just, uh, there's a couple of different things I'll probably read. Um, when we look at, um, even in the period of late antiquity or whatever we might, we might call that sub-Roman period, or the age of Arthur or something, even there, there are early saints, uh, for want of a bit of a word, or, or, or priests who are engaged in warfare sort of indirectly. Um, you know, maybe they don't biff people with weapons or anything like that, but they were um, there to pray for the armies. And in particular case, in the life of St. Germanus in, um, in the 5th century, and I'm just reading a little excerpt from um, a book I have by Sean Davies called War and Society in Medieval Wales. Um, it talks about the earliest account of a post Roman of post Roman warfare in Britain is from Constantius's Life of Saint Germanus, where the saint is said to have taken command of a British force somewhere in the south in four twenty nine to meet the invading Picts and Saxons. The invaders advanced holding sorry, hoping to surprise the British, but they were spotted by scouts. Armed with good intelligence, Germanus led his light troops forward to ambush, ambush the enemy. Although no blow was struck, the enemy fled in panic and the event is proclaimed as a great victory. So there you go. There, there you see St. Germanus was leading troops and I believe he was a... a from a noble sort of family on the continent. Um, so, again, it doesn't say he was biffing people or anything like that, but he was certainly feeling it was his part as a Christian leader to in lead and inspire the troops. And um, But when you, when you go back, and um, I have another book here um, about the life of Columba. It's uh, by... Bruce Ritchie, it's called The Faith of an Island Soldier, and it's on the life of St. Columba. Um, earlier in this, the early centuries, before we had these developments in which ended in the, the crusade type mentality, monastic types had always seen themselves in a sort of a soldierly light. And, and you know, not without justification, when you read the letters of St. Paul, he does talk about uh, running the race and fighting the good fight, and those who are familiar with the scriptures know that he talks about putting on the armor of God and 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 things like that. So there is that sort of typology, that picture language there. So um, yeah, in uh, this book about um, Columba, I'll just read you an excerpt here. Uh, the term soldier is significant because it identifies a central characteristic of the monastic life. Everything which was done within the monastery was part of soldiering. Monks were not military soldiers of Christ, as they disastrously became during the Crusades, but spiritual warriors. Spiritual military duty was the task of all monks everywhere, with Benedict's rule stressing this dimension when reflecting on the life of a solitary monk. And to quote from uh, the rule of St. Benedict, they have built up their strength and go from the battle line in the ranks of their brothers to the single combat of the desert. Self-reliant now without the support of another, they are ready with God's help to grapple single-handed with the vices of body and mind. And we know that Columba himself came from a noble Irish family and again would have had experience with um, warfare and uh, before he um, took up his calling. And there was another, p some interesting passages here about um, sort of the, before they ever, you know, the early church was always a matter, there was, there, there was this sort of militancy, but it wasn't, it wasn't, didn't tend to be uh, physical. Although, interestingly, often, um, and I haven't got, uh, the passage to hand, but there are accounts of uh, battles um, 
say the early Anglo-Saxons against the Welsh and um, other peoples and the Vikings against Anglo-Saxons where there could be groups of priests or monks or something present on the battlefield at the back of the lines. There's one account that I recall where they were praying and and so like like these chappies here, you know, they were praying for the success of, uh, of their army of, you know, they saw that, you know, they were in the right now praying that the day went well. And um, that accounts uh, talk about how, you know, those guys, when the battle didn't go well and they, uh, their army took flight, those guys were massacred because in, you know, to their enemy, they were seen as warriors. They were seen but as spiritual warriors because unlike, you know, our, our modern Western mindset, um, there was a much more, you know, a greater depth of the spiritual realities of life and, and you know, um, God being active in the world and um, they didn't want, to, uh, the enemy didn't want to, their enemy to have any sort of advantage in that in that area <laughs> okay i'll just see if i can find uh, if there's some really uh, great accounts um of um columba engaging in warfare spiritual warfare um i was reading one earlier about um forcing his way into uh yeah that's right the uh Brede, one of the pictish kings and um <laughs> when columba arrived at Brede's fort the gates were slammed shut against him but columba made the sign of the cross and only then did he put his hand to the door to knock and um it talks about how the doors were opened um miraculously and this sort of thing and um so yeah there's very much a sort of a these guys were at war and um but yeah somehow the message got kind of mixed as the centuries went on until it got to a point where by the crusade you've got guys taking up actual arms and of course as we know the um the orders that developed from it um ostensibly you know with the pope's approval to protect pilgrims but we know um that it kind of developed further from there. Um, so it's interesting how things diverge. Um, yeah, so that's uh, my first little chat. Look at some miniatures. And uh, yeah, next time we'll probably, uh, I've made some more progress. I'll grab a cluster of, maybe we'll grab some archers and I'll see if I can find something about, um, I know I've got a good book on um, English Warrior. Um, by uh, Pollington um, that actually, you know, will make some comments about the Anglo-Saxons use of archery um, and how there actually wasn't an awful lot of it that, that we uh, know about in battles, but um, although they did use the bow extensively, obviously, for hunting. So we'll see if we can find some readings and historical thoughts as we look at different things. I'll have to see if I can find out anything about Ragnar lost Brock or something like that although i don't have any um actual like copies of any of the sagas like any of the penguin classics or anything but i'm sure i'll probably better find something in a second resource anyway i hope that was of some interest uh tomorrow all uh, all being well i shall start to block in some colors i'll probably start with the um footsaw archers and those spearmen and we'll certainly block in all the flesh and all these guys all right, thanks for tuning in, and um, we'll catch you next time. Bye.